I'd like to uh, now introduce uh, our speaker. Um, Deacon Mike and I have just been blessed to know uh, Joan Watson now for a number of years. As I said, she's uh, one of the most popular writers for Integrated Catholic Life. Um, she has been uh, a fixture in Catholic circles for a number of years, has worked for the church. Um, she's got degrees from Christendom College and Franciscan University of Steubenville. Um, and as I said, she's worked for the church and religious apostolates for almost 15 years. One of the things to understand about Joan is, um, is how seriously she takes the role of evangelization. And, you know, her heart and her, her life is dedicated to this idea of sharing Christ with other people uh, and promoting the teachings of the church. I also want to encourage you to take a look at Joan's new website. It's very new, uh, and she'll tell you more about it in a second, but it's joanmwatson.com. So I really encourage you to go there, learn more about Joan and her work. And uh, just uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our friend Joan, and uh, really excited to hear what she's got to say about St. Joan of Arc. So Joan, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Randy and Deacon Mike. It is really an honor and a pleasure. I have been writing for Integrated Catholic Life, and I am happy to call these men friends. Um, I recently left my job at the Diocese of Nashville, and I will tell you a little bit about that at the end. But one of the reasons I had the guts to do that with all the good Catholic friends I have that are that were supporting me and that were encouraging me and so I'm really grateful for their friendship and their their mentorship more than anything. I am going to take a few moments at the beginning of this talk and I'm going to share my screen here to to talk about the kind of life of St. Joan of Arc just a timeline because I think a lot of times we know her, she's probably one of the most well-known Catholic saints in the secular world because of her secular work. Um, but I think we need to really kind of delve into kind of the, some of the specifics, especially of her trial, to see what lessons we can gain from her. You know, growing up, she was my patroness. I wasn't strictly named after her, but I was named after her. And I kind of struggled with her as my patroness because to me, it's a, it's a strange story. Um, I think we just have to admit that. It's a strange story. Why did God choose to directly intervene in the Hundred Years' War of all wars, right? Why? What is it about France and the Hundred Years' War that God directly intervened in the life of a 19-year-old girl that, you know, that, that went into battle when she was 17 years old? And um, so it's a strange story. And I also struggled with her even as a feminine um, archetype. You know, she's been adopted by the feminist movement a lot because she wore male clothing. And there's a lot in her story that I just struggled with that how do I see her as a model for me as a Catholic woman? And so I wanna kind of talk through her story a little bit. Um, she's actually, they say that she is the most um, of all, especially medieval figures. She, we know more about Jane Joan of Arc than any other historical figure. More has been written about her than any other historical figure. Um, but I do want to take some time to go through her life. And then I want to pull three lessons out that through praying to her, praying with her, I've come to kind of three lessons that she's given me of what it means to be a Catholic um, woman, but just a Catholic in the world. So when we look at kind of her timeline, this is just for reference. Um, she's, she's born probably in 1412. We don't actually know. Uh, we have to put ourselves in that medieval um, frame of mind. And when she was asked at trial how old she was, she was like, as far as I know, I'm 19. Um, so you have to remember that, you know, there, there's a different kind of, of keeping of history at that point. But we believe she was born in 1412. And this puts her right at the beginning of the third phase of the Hundred Years' War. So I'm gonna do you all a favor and I'm not going to go into the politics of the Hundred Years' War. Um, you know, the longest um, real military, um, it, you know, it's the longest war of medieval history and it's complicated and we're not gonna get into it. Um, but she is born at the beginning of the third and final phase. And that's the phase that she's of course active in. And in this third phase, what's important to know is that France is also, France isn't just at war with England, France is at war with itself. So there's a civil war raging between um, the, the parts of France that are faithful to England and the heir to the throne that England's claiming to have to the French throne. 
and also loyal to French, um, English ways of doing things, English ways of, of, of society and, and, and economics. And those we would call the Burgundians under the Duke of Burgundy. And then we have the Armagnacs, um, which many of us might only know because um, we have cognac and Armagnac, but um, it was a group of, of French. It wasn't, it's not just an alcoholic drink. Um, it was the group of French, of, of French um, loyalists who were loyal to the French heir to the throne and were loyal to the French way of doing things. And so Joan is born in the middle of the civil war, the beginning of the civil war, and then obviously she's active in it. Um, Joan's family even actually had to leave their village for a short time um, because of this civil war that was raging in France. So when she's born, we have lots of accounts of her childhood. And for all intents and purposes, she was a pretty normal young woman um, growing up at that time. She had a very normal childhood of anybody born in the middle of the Hundred Years' War, except when she's 13, she begins to hear what she would call her voices. Um, she later will, will identify these as St. Michael, St. Catherine of Alexandria, and St. Margaret. Um, which in some ways seem kind of like a random group of people, you know, a random group of saints to appear to somebody. Um, it's likely St. Margaret had a statue in the um, Domremy, her home uh, parish. And so she was used to praying to St. Margaret, which I think is really beautiful that then St. Margaret appears to her. But when she's 13, they, she starts to receive visions. And we don't actually know that much about her visions because when she's on trial later, she won't speak much about her voices. So, um, you know, we know that these are the saints that spoke to her. And we know at the beginning, they simply encouraged her to live a life of holiness. Um, it's really beautiful. They just kind of encouraged her. And she was already living a pretty um, devout life for a young girl. Witnesses who were later asked said, you know, she went to, to church daily, either to mass or to Compline or to the Angelus. She went to confession regularly. And so of, of the young women in the, in, the, um, in the small, small, small town, she was born to a very small town, she was a devout young girl. So her voices encourage her in this. Um, so at the beginning, they just encourage her to keep going to church and to live um, the Christian life. Again, in, on trial, she doesn't talk a lot about her voices. And it reminded me of, like she says, I will swear under oath to answer any of your questions about where I was born and my parents, but I will not tell you about my voices. And it reminded me of kind of Jesus standing in front of Herod, you know, in his trial where he remains mute because Herod doesn't have the faith to receive what Jesus is going to say. And so she's standing in trial and it's almost like she doesn't want to reveal too much of, of these, these intimate moments that God gave her. But we know that when she was 13 years old, she heard voices and um, they continued through her entire life. So these voices would, would accompany her um, into battle and then even into prison and as she um, approached her death. As she grew older, um, the voices told her that she had been chosen to lead an army so that the Dauphin, who's the heir, that's the traditional name given to the heir of the French throne. Um, the Dauphin, who's there, then in exile, is not on the French throne, but is the French claimant to the throne, Charles VII. Um, they said, you're going to lead an army so that the Dauphin can, be, can come to the throne and can have, be um, crowned king of France. Now, um, we have kind of word for word. Again, we have a lot on Joan because we have such ample records from her trial. So all the quotes I have are either from people who were um, interviewed during her uh, post after she died, she was, there was another rehabilitation trial or her trial. So this is all, these are all quotes from her trial when she was on trial for heresy and for witchcraft. So again, first the voices simply told her to conduct herself well, to go habitually to church. She was scared at first of the voices as we all probably would have been, but they, they reassured her. So she responds, you know, they say you're supposed to go to Robert de Baudricourt, who is leading, you know, it's the, the head of one of the cities nearby. You're supposed to tell him to take you to the Dauphin and tell the Dauphin, I've been chosen to lead an army. I mean, we have to realize how ridiculous this is, right? Like this is, can you imagine she's at this point, she's 17 years old. Um, okay, you know, 16, 17, you are going to go. And she's like, I don't even know how to ride a war horse. I don't even know how to, you know, how am I going to do this? But she obeys her voices and she goes to Robert um, de Baudricourt 
And somehow she convinces him. Um, and everybody who, who speaks of it says like, she was remarkably convincing um, that she convinces him, take me to Charles and I'm gonna tell Charles that I'm gonna lead an army. And the two signs where she was gonna raise, uh, raise the siege of Orléans, which Orléans right then was under siege for about a, a year under the Bur uh, Burgundians. Um, and that was a, a, a massive city that if Orléans fell, the war was pretty much over. Um, that, that England had then gained so much ground in France, it was over. So the sign was gonna be, I'm gonna raise the siege of Orléans and then I'm gonna get Charles crowned king. Somehow people believe her um, and it's, it's ridiculous. And everybody says she's astonishingly convincing. Um, and you have to put yourself in these, these men's shoes. This, this uh, Joan is the wrong gender the wrong age and the wrong class. I mean, here we have a peasant girl who's uneducated um, and this is a hyper patriarchal society. I mean, you could see why she's been adopted by feminists, right? Um, I really don't have anything wrong with patriarchy, but she's, she's living in this society where women aren't going to war, much less leading French armies and she's 16 years old. So um, it's ridiculous, but Robert says, okay, let's, let's go. And this shows kind of the leadership and the, the witness of Joan that she somehow convinces Robert to say, take me to the Dauphin. So they go to the Dauphin and the Dauphin at first won't hear her, won't listen to her, of course. Would you, would you be like, oh sure, I'll listen to a 16, 17 year old girl who's gonna lead my army. But he eventually listens to her and he has her tested um, by university professors at Poitiers and this we've lost all records of this and it's unfortunate because this would be this would tell us a lot because Joan was probably much more forthcoming at this than she was at her own trial for heresy and witchcraft so it's sad that we've lost this record but they they test her um they test her and to see what is and somehow she convinces these university professors that she is not a heretic that she is not crazy that she's not an insane person and they tell the Dauphin and some, she speaks frequently to the Dauphin at this point and she tells him something, we don't know what. She gives him some sign that she's from God. And so he gives her an army and she goes to Orléans to raise uh, the siege of Orléans. Now, um, Orléans had been under siege for about a year. And again, it's a, it's a crucial, um, it's a key to, to French success. And so, it had been under siege for about a year and it was, um, it, the, it was so bleak. The situation was so bleak that the citizens, um, one biog biographer sums up after reading the citizens account of this time, the inhabitants and citizens found themselves squeezed in such necessity by the besieging enemies that they knew not whom to have recourse to for a remedy excepting to God. They knew it would take a miracle for this to be, to, to, for them to be freed. And we have to remember, we're dealing in a time where everybody believed miracles were possible and they were about to see one. So she goes to um, Orléans and for some reason, there we go. Um, and she, within you know weeks, raises the siege of Orléans. So she has to convince the French there to trust her. She quickly, they for some reason, quickly trust her. And there's actually an issue for her entering the city. So there's one area where she can enter the city, where, where supplies can enter the city. There's an issue with the wind. And the leader of Orléans at that time, um, he has the, the nice name of the bastard of Orléans. That's how he's known. Um, he was leading the city at that point. And he you know, protests and says, you can't enter the city. And the wind shifts in such a way that when the wind shifts, she's able to enter the city and they everybody later says this was a miracle that this even happened and so from then on Jean Jean Orleans John of Orleans um, the bastard of Orleans trusts her and accompanies her and fights alongside her and um, and we see that again and again that these men put utter trust in her she's a simple girl um, really uneducated illiterate but when it comes to drawing up battle plans she's an expert somehow so. You know, you have some historians who say she was just a mascot for the French and, you know, she was pulled out of nowhere to kind of show like, look, you know, and just kind of be a mascot and not really do anything. But that's false. We see here at Orléans and then later in the battles that follow, 
that she is the mastermind of this of this of the battles and, and it, it's inexplicable you cannot explain how this girl knows warfare one of her knights testified joan behaved as if she had been the shrewdest captain in the world and had all her life been learning the art of war so after several skirmishes she liberates the city on may 8th in the morning of the battle uh, there are several little battles but in the morning of the battle she predicts that she'll be wounded and sure enough she is an arrow strikes her in the upper chest um and so she's struck by an arrow She's taken out of the battle. They want to put like a magic amulet on her wound. And she says, I would rather die than do a thing which is known to be a sin or against the will of God. She ends up, um, some reports are that she pulled the arrow out herself and she entered the battle again. She goes and she takes the time for prayer and then goes back into battle. Um, it's interesting that you hear all these comments from her, um, despite the fact that she'll be eventually burned as a heretic, Throughout her life, we see her driven to do the will of God. She's always striving for holiness. She never wants to do anything that's against the will of God. So she liberates the city on May 8th. And to this day, even through the French Revolution, even through the reign of terror, Orléans celebrates Joan of Arc Day on May 8th. Um, because this was such a huge victory and such a huge turning point um, for the city and for the war itself, the Hundred Years' War. So Joan's fame quickly spreads. Um, she begins to be consulted as if she was a magician or like could see the future and the people are writing her letters. Um, the University of Paris draws up a memo accusing her of heresy and witchcraft because the University of Paris at that point, it's important to know, is really run by English um, sympathizers. But only one half of her mission is finished and Joan needs to get the Dauphin crowned at Reims. Um, he is wishy-washy. Um, Charles VII is really a tragic figure in this story. He's really wishy-washy. He doesn't want to go to Reims for some reason. And then eventually she gets him to go and he's crowned. And at this point, the French all say he's the Lord's anointed. And this really turns the tide for French victory. Um, the stories of Joan's courage during this time, because she continues to fight battles, she really restores the people's hope. Um, these, these men are willing to follow her anywhere. And it's such a testament. I mean, they're, they're not even getting paid at this point because France is in such bad shape and they don't care. They said, we'll follow the maid wherever she goes. Um, I mean, the story of her courage, she's hit in the head by a rock, it shatters her helmet and she like picks herself back up and like goes back into the battle. Um, after Charles VII is crowned, Joan's continuing to fight battles. Um, she wants to go to Paris because that that's under the control of the Burgundians and she knows that will be kind of a, a turning point. Um, but Charles, again, he's a really sad character in this. He doesn't want to go. He ends up splitting up her army, separating her from the, the Duke of Alençon, who's really her, her close confidant and her best commander. They, he separates them. Um, he is wishy-washy and it's a tragic, tragic part of this story. Um, Joan continues to fight. She actually goes to Paris. She's wounded while attacking Paris. She's struck in the, the thigh with a crossbow and they take her out of the fight. And she's ticked off that they've taken her out of the fight. In 1430, so she's only been fighting for, you know, a little over a year now. Um, they, they take, you know, they're besieging a city north of, of Paris, Copenhagen, and she's taken. She's taken by the Burgundians. Um, her voices had told her that she would be taken. She was anticipating that she would be captured. So onto the scene, we have the Bishop of Beauvais, Pierre Cochon. And Pierre Cochon is an important character in our story because he had been rector of the University of Paris. Remember, Paris, the University of Paris is, is, um, has allegiance to the English, not to the French anymore. And he had been rector of the University of Paris and he had been um, kicked out of his hometown of Reims, Reims, where Charles was crowned, because of Joan's success. He had been kicked out of Beauvais, his di diocese, because of Joan's success. And he's been humiliated basically by Joan. So he goes to the Burgundians, Bishop Pierre Cochon goes to the Burgundians, gives the Burgundians lots of money for Joan and gets to try Joan for heresy. 
Now, a heretic is supposed to be judged in their hometown or in the place where the heresy took place by a bishop with jurisdiction in that place. Um, Pierre Cochon judges her in Rouen and he has no jurisdiction. He has to get um, a special, you know, he draws up papers that he can try her. And she should have, if she was tried for heresy, she should have been tried in an ecclesiastical court. She should have been held in ecclesiastical prison guarded by women. But essentially she's tried as a prisoner of war. She's kept in a civil prison, kept in irons, which would have not happen to a heretic, um, kept in ecclesiastical prison and guarded by male English jailers. She had no advocate. There was no one there to represent her. And anybody who tried to advise her was punished. We have all the records of her trial. Um, and there's evidence that the trial was altered. Even as the records went on throughout the day, they would alter kind of what she said. Um, but we have all the records of her trial and you can see how unjust this trial is. They, um, the men quickly like changed subjects to try to like trip her up. They went back and forth to confuse her. They tried to distract her to get her to contradict herself. She is remarkably composed during this trial. Um, she shows an air of intelligence and of a theology that, that confounded even the men, the judges, the priests and bishops that were trying her. Um, when they would go back and forth with topics, she would say, well, I answered that question last Wednesday. You should look at the records. Um, it's remarkable. Her court escort who stayed with her said, I was astonished to see how she could answer the subtle and captious answer questions which were put to her, which a lettered man would have difficulty in answering. She's stunning in her answers. Um, one of the most famous is here on the slide. She was asked if she's in God's grace. And she said, if I am not, may God put me there. If I am, may God so keep me. Um, this is really the only answer that theologically uh, should be given to this question. She does not presume, but she does not despair. It's stunning. When Pierre Cochon makes her, uh, tells her that he wants her to recite the Our Father and the Hail Mary, she says she will do so if he hears her confession, which puts him in a remarkably difficult situation. He can't hear her confession. Um, I mean, he could but that would put him in a hard spot and he can't deny her confession because he's a priest. And so he just adjourns the trial that day. She's even humorous. They ask her if St. Michael uh, was naked when he appeared to her. And she said, do you think God couldn't afford to clothe him? Um, and so she, she's just witty, she's intelligent and it's very hard for them to trap her. So there's a couple different ways they could trap her. They could, um, they could burn her at the stake for witchcraft and heresy. Um, they could trap her as being impure, or they could say that she was not submitting to the church. So the tactic they took, because they could not prove, they, the way she was answering their questions, she did not show any evidence of being a heretic. She showed no evidence of impurity. The only way they could trap her was they used her male clothing as a sign that she was refusing to submit to the church. And so they kept saying, you're not submitting to the church because you're not submitting to us. And she said, I'll go to Rome and I'll submit to the Pope. And they said, well, you can't do that. It's too far away, which is ridiculous because that's actually who she should have been answering to. She should have been tried by the, uh, the Inquisitor General of Rome. Her trial lasts from January to May. And one issue that comes up towards the end is that she recants. So she does sign a document on May 24th that says she denies her visions. Now, one thing just briefly before we get into the lessons, we have to treat this because this is really shown, this is really brought up as a, a sign that Joan was false. So there's lots of evidence that what she signed, so she's, just to put it in perspective, she's taken in front of a scaffold and she's told you will be burned today at the stake if you don't recant. She's terrified of being burned. We know this from her trial. She speaks about the human terror of, of being burned at the stake. So she's given this statement. Um, witnesses say it was six or seven lines long and it focused on not wearing male clothing anymore and not going back to war. She signs the statement. She's taken back to her jail cell, which she never should have been. She, if she says she, um, if she admits to this, she should have been freed or she should have taken, been taken to an ecclesiastical prison. She's taken back to her jail cell She's given women's clothing. Um, and she's like, where am I going? Like this, you're, you know, they basically, you know, they, 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 they didn't do what they promised her to do. Later, a statement was inserted 
with her signature that's pages long and talks about her denying her voices. So there's evidence that she didn't sign that statement that says she denied her voices. But the key is here, they needed her to be a heretic and to recant in order to burn her. So what they do is they say, you, won't, you can't wear Whitman's clothing anymore. They put her back in the jail cell. They either, days later, either remove all her female clothing from her cell, so she's forced to put male clothing on, or there's good evidence that she was sexually abused by her jailers and she put male clothing on because that's the only thing that would protect her from further sexual abuse. Pierre Cochon comes back into her cell on May 31st or May 30th, finds her in men's clothing and says, she's a recant, you know, she's, she's, um, you know, she's going to be burned because she um, went back on her heresy. So she was put back on trial. She affirmed her belief in her voices she was condemned to death by burning, which actually the church um, should have handed her over it to the civil authorities at this point, and they did not. When she was going to her death, she said, Bishop, I die by you. Bishop, I die by you. And um, she said she knew she should have been tried by an ecclesiastical court. She died on May 30th, 1431, and her last request was that a crucifix be brought to her. So that could be the last thing she saw when she died. Um, just quickly, she was rehabilitated. There was a rehabilitation trial. Um, it lasted for about seven years and 150 people about were brought forward. Um, and it was partly called by her mother after her death. And eventually um, she had to be tried by the church because she had been condemned by the church and the church found her guilty and found Pierre Cochon actually um, guilty of heresy for convicting an innocent girl because of a personal vendetta. So that's kind of a little synopsis of her story. I wanted to get into the three lessons that I think Joan gives us. Um, and I'll have time afterwards if you if there was any gap in that story, if you need um, answers. Um, I think Joan manifests true leadership. I mean, we see it from the way her men were willing to follow her to the ends of the earth. But I think the reason she manifests this is that she knew what her men were capable of and she expected it. She knew what her men were capable of and she expected it. We see this with great saints and we see this with great leaders. I was in Rome when John Paul II died and I was studying over there and I was actually on an EWTN TV show to talk about the youth impact, you know, John Paul II's impact on the youth. And this is what one of my friends said about JP2. Why was JP2 so impactful on the youth? And he said, because he knew what we were capable of and he expected it of us. He called us to something higher. And this was Joan. She knew what her men were capable of. She knew that they could be courageous. She knew that they could be heroes. And most of all, she knew that they could be holy. We are talking about a time in history where corruption ran rampant. France wasn't going to win this war because in God, God wasn't like, well, France is really holy. And so I, no, France was just as wicked as England was at that point. Men were corrupt. Um, the papacy was corrupt. The papacy was corrupt. Everybody was corrupt. Joan called her men to holiness. You did not go to battle without going to confession. She had priests follow the army. They sang the Veni Creator Spiritus. They gave, she gave them their own standards so you knew exactly where the priests were so you could go confess. They had prayer services twice a day. If you didn't confess, you couldn't go to the prayer services. Um, she inspired her men to greatness. One of, her, um, one of her men said, I remember very well, this is one of the commanders of her army, said, I remember very well that from the moment I was with her, never did I have the will to do evil. This is a, a rich French, you know, general. He never had the will to do evil when he was with Joan. That is what we're called to do. So you probably don't hear voices. I mean, maybe you do, but you might be worried if you do. You probably don't hear voices, but you can have this type of leadership like Joan. Why? Because you can call the people around you to greatness. You can expect greatness from yourself and from others. You set the bar high. When the Dauphin, as I mentioned, when the Dauphin was reluctant to go to be crowned, the men were like, we're gonna follow the maid anywhere. 
right? We're going to serve her wherever she goes. That's leadership. They wanted to follow her. They wanted to be holy for her. They wanted to be great for her. And I think that's key to leadership. She also knew her rightful place, which I think is also a very important uh, role in leadership, a very important lesson. She knew her rightful place. She knew the rightful place of everyone around her. She knew that Charles VII should be king of France. And she called him to that, even though he didn't deserve it. He is a, a sad, sad sack in our story. She knew he was called to be king and she was going to have him anointed king. At this point, she could probably be anointed king, right? People liked her more than they liked Charles, but she called him to that rightful place, even when he didn't want it. She knew her place. She knew the Dauphin's place and she called him to that. She expected that. And when we look at her leadership, we see that on every step of the way, she trusted in the Lord. You know, I think sometimes we were asked to trust the Lord and we, we misunderstand that as being kind of a passive, oh, just sit here and trust the Lord. But, the, but Joan trusted the Lord as she acted. There's a great quote where she says, act and God will act. God doesn't, act, doesn't ask you to sit aside, you know, to sit aside as a passive watcher in your life. He calls you to act to lead others, and he will act with you. When she was tested initially at Potier, when she was tested initially by the Dauphin, she was tested by saying, well, if God wants France to win the war, he can just make it happen. He doesn't need knights. He doesn't need an army. And she responded, by God, the men at arms will do battle, and God will give the victory. God wants us to participate in his work. And that's true leadership, to trust in the Lord, but to act, and God will act. I think the second lesson uh, Joan gives is what it looks to be meek. Now, this might be an interesting, uh, an interesting description for a warrior saint, that she was meek, but we misunderstand what meekness really is. People equate meekness with weakness. That to be meek, you sit back and you kind of let things happen and you watch and you don't protest. But that's not meekness. The meek will inherit the land. And Joan of Arc inherited that land of France. The Greek word for meekness that we use is also used for a tamed wild animal. And this is important because wild animals have a lot of power, but they have destructive power unless they're tamed. And when that wild animal is tamed, they don't lose their power, but their power is used for, 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 for their power becomes productive and life-giving and um, it accomplishes great things. A wild animal that's not tamed is destructive. So meekness isn't a matter of not being powerful, but it's actually a power. Meekness is power because we're channeling that energy, we're channeling anger, we're channeling our emotions towards the good. It's controlling that. Self-possession is a good example, is a good definition for meekness. And to possess oneself doesn't mean you're weak and ineffective. Rather, it means you're powerful because you properly react to the situation at hand. And so um, it doesn't, again, it doesn't mean to be passive. We're learning this, right? It's not about being passive. It's about being active, but being controlled. And I think meekness is a virtue that our modern world lacks. And why do I say this? Because anger is the opposition to meekness. Now, anger isn't bad, but it has to be properly controlled. And nowadays we're getting angry at everything. We're getting angry Everybody on every side gets angry every day and lashes out. But meekness moderates anger. Um, it's a form of temperance, Father John Harden would say. And so the meek don't allow themselves to be controlled by their emotions, but they don't lack emotions. It's a matter of what controls me. Um, and so the meek don't seek revenge. They face adversity with courage. They know how to respond to evil and they do it well. And that's Joan, right? Joan fights. She fights for the Lord. You know, she leaps into the fray. She pulls arrows out of her own chest. But she doesn't do that out of anger. She doesn't do it out of spite. She does it for the Lord. You know, when the English died in the Battle of Orleans, 
Reports are that Joan wept over the men that died, over the enemies that died. She wept. Why? Because they had, they, she was worried for their souls. She wept over lost souls. She didn't want them. She wasn't revengeful. She wasn't spiteful. She didn't want them to die. When uh, the Duke of Burgundy, she wrote to the Duke of Burgundy several times. And on the day of Charles crowning, she wrote to him and she said, forgive each other with good heart entirely as good Christians must do, as faithful Christians must do. So she was always urging, you know, like we could end this. We don't have to be fighting. We could end this because we could forgive each other. That's what the meek do. They forgive their enemies. And again, she doesn't do anything that she doesn't believe the Lord wills her to do. Um, even her death, right? She fights very human emotions against death, but she approaches it with that trust in the Lord. She's always trusting in the Lord. That's kind of the, the lesson of Joan. Um, and so she forgives those who kill her. You know, she's going to her death and she forgives those at the stake. And she says, to, she asks them to pray for her. And so we're faced daily with problems in the world, in the church. And it's very natural for us to get angry, to get self-righteous, to think we have all the answers. But the meek trust in the Lord. And no, we don't know that whole story, but we do our part and we're faithful and we seek holiness. And so what our world needs more of is meek souls who have self-mastery, who are willing to fight against injustice, but at the end of the day, step back and recognize I'm not God and it's in God's hands. So again, it's not, meekness isn't a call to be passive, but is a, is, is a call to face adversity with charity, with mercy, and with trust. And lastly, Joan reminds us to love the church. I think there's a temptation when we've, especially when we've been hurt by the church, there's a temptation to separate the church into two, to help us deal with that hurt, to help us deal with the pain. And so we try to explain the sin in the church by making a distinction between the institutional church that's made up of sinners and the body of Christ that is founded by Christ and is in heaven. You know, so the first is sinners and rules, and the second is the body of Christ and the sinless bride. But if we read the scriptures, Jesus doesn't give us two churches. Jesus gives us one church, and that church, the kingdom of heaven, is a net filled with good and bad fish, right? It's a field filled with wheat and weeds. Um, the Second Vatican Council called the church a complex reality. In that one church, there are saints and there are sinners. You know, Ronald Knox points out, Judas Iscariot proved to be a rotten member of the church, but he was a member for all that. Um, we, can't, we can't explain sin away by saying, well, they're not really a member of the church, or I belong to this body of Christ that's sinless, and I don't have to listen to the institutional church that's full of sinners. If anybody had reason to feel bitter towards the institutional church, it was Joan of Arc. <laughs> if anybody had reason to hate the church, it was Joan of Arc. She faced a courtroom full of clerics and a bishop as her judge. And the men of the church tried to trap her into uttering heresy. In the midst of her trial, they asked her multiple times what she believed about the church, what she believed about church teachings. And she famously responded, I abide by God who sent me by the Holy Virgin and all the saints in paradise. And I am of opinion that it is all one and the same thing, God and the church. And of that, one should make no difficulty. Why do you make difficulty over that? That's an incredible statement by someone who had so much reason to hate the church. She said, as for the church, I love her and would wish to sustain her with all my power for the Christian faith. And it is not I who should be prevented from going to church and hearing mass. Um, a little snarky at the end, and I kind of like that. Uh, three of the clergy in the courtroom would eventually become cardinals. A dozen would become bishops and abbots of monasteries. Joan had reason to hate the church, but she didn't. She professed again and again that she believed in the Catholic faith and that she pledged her trust and her faith in the church. She recognized that these evil men were evil, but they were representatives of the church for her and the church was still lovable despite them. 
Let's return to our character of Bishop Pierre Cochon. Joan was subject to um, intense psychological and spiritual suffering and torture. I'm not sure if many of us would blame her if she lost the faith. Um, I hope that I could keep the faith. I, I, I trust that her voices gave her great consolation during this time. Um, but she remained firmly faithful to the church. You know, many people have tried to persuade me that we're living in dark times, that the end must be near because we've never seen what we're seeing today. And I'm sorry, I'm a student of church history and my patroness of Joan of Arc and is Joan of Arc. And pardon me if I say, I think we've lived through worse times. It also bears mentioning that Joan was born in the middle of the Western schism, which means when she was born, we had three people claiming to be Pope. When she was burned at the stake, we had two men claiming to be Pope. We've seen really bad times in the church. And you know what? The church has survived. And that's an important lesson for Joan. If we go back to our friend Pierre Cochon, the Bishop of Beauvais, he had a vendetta against Joan and he was gonna use this trial to, to condemn her to death. And he believed that if he used this and he was successful in trying Joan, he would be given a premier see. He wanted to move up in the church. And so he used this trial as a way to move up and to become Bishop of Rouen. But you know what? Pierre Couchon wasn't given the diocese of Rouen. He was given a backwater town that had been beset by plague and war in the north of France that nobody wanted. After Joan's trial, Pierre Cochon became the bishop of a little backwater town named Lisieux. Pierre Cochon, one of the most evil represent representatives of the church, gets the souls of Lisieux, France. And did he destroy the faith in Lisieux, France? This evil, perhaps one of the most evil bishops we've ever seen. Did he destroy the faith of Lisieux? No. Why? Because Lisieux later, hundreds of years later, gives us one of the greatest doctors of the church, St. Therese. So once again, Joan reminds us to trust in the Lord, to not lose the faith, but to stay close to the sacraments, to be strong in the face of the adversity, and to remember God's ultimately in control. We haven't destroyed the church yet. We're not gonna destroy the church. And what matters is our personal holiness because the church has survived because holiness is always more powerful than darkness. So those are the three lessons that I think we get from Joan and then trust in the Lord is in all three, right? True leaders know what their people, what the people around them are capable of and they expect it. True power is found in meekness and stay faithful to the church because holiness is always more powerful than darkness. And in all of that is trust. So while Joan might be one of the stranger saint stories, and I still question why God chose to directly intervene into the hundred years war, I think there's a lot she has to teach us even today. There's one statement she made during her trial that's key to her. She was asked, why you than another? Why you rather than someone else? And she responded, it pleased God thus to do by a simple maid to drive out the king's enemies. It's the story of David and Goliath. It's the story of Frodo and the ring. It's the story of Jesus and the cross. Paul reminds us, God chose the foolish of the world to shame the wise, and he chose the weak of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly and despised of the world, those who count for nothing, to reduce to nothing those who are something. And so let us emulate Joan in her trust, in her meekness, in her faith, in her love. Before I open up for questions, um, I just kind of want to introduce myself. I am, um, I've been writing for Integrated Catholic Life for I think five or six years now, and I was a Originally, um, when I started writing, I was a, working at the Diocese of Nashville as their director of faith formation. And I just recently left to um, speak and write full time. And it's always been a dream of mine to do this, to work for the church in a different way. And so I'm excited to start this grand adventure. Um, I travel around the country. I speak at parishes, um, you know, retreats, parish missions, teacher in-services, catechetical opportunities like that. 
And um, as Randy said, I have a brand new website, so you can check it out there and see, um, you know, some of the things I offer. I'd also invite you to partner with me. You know, I joked with somebody the other day that I used to work for the for the diocese and now I work for you. Um, I really feel myself working for the people of God in a way that the apostles did. You know, the apostles, Paul, we saw in the, the first reading yesterday, Paul traveled and he depended on the generosity of the church. I think of the great works of art that have been created throughout the centuries. Many of them weren't, weren't in, um, you know, they, they aren't the works of art paid for by institutional church. They weren't the works of art paid for by dioceses, but they were paid for by patrons. And you often see the patron at the bottom of the work of art because they, they realized that the, the, they were called to share their goodness and to share the gifts of God to help evangelize, even in ways they might not be able to evangelize. And so you'll see a Patreon link at the bottom there. And I'm really, at this point, depending on support and patrons to help me do this work, whether it's writing and speaking, but really the work of evangelization, wherever the spirit takes me next, to, um, to be partnered with. That I'm inviting you to partner, to support, just like they supported Paul, just like they supported the great works of art. Um, Patreon was originally set up to help artists and help people support artists. And I love kind of taking it over for the gospel and saying that there's a great art to evangelization. There's a great art to sharing the gospel. And so um, you are supporting an artist just of a different kind. So um, thank you in advance. If you can support me and can partner with me, I promise um, you'll be part of this great journey in evangelization and the new evangelization. Uh, my, my heart is really with helping those people in the pew um, the pips. I think so often we get ignored. Those of us sitting in the pew wanting to be fed. And um, I love the, the work of St. Peter Chanel. Your parish does a great job with adult formation, but so many people are left hungry and thirsty. And that's really where my heart is, is to help um, the people in the pew. So, okay, I'm done talking. I'll answer questions. <laughs> Joan, thank you. Thank you very much. What, a, what an incredible <clears throat> presentation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. A few people had to drop off and <clears throat> one of them um, commented on just how, how, how much he admired and, and enjoyed the presentation. That those comments are coming in, so I thought you ought to know that. Um, I, I think Sabrina just made a comment also that I think is worth sharing with everyone. She she says, she says to you, what a wonderful presentation. And she thanks you and mentioned that she had gone to Orleans and that you now have made her pilgrimage mm. even more meaningful. Uh, she thanks you and blesses you. Ask God to bless you. Um, I, I think let's get this one too out of the way. Do you have any recommendations of content to learn more about Joan of Arc? And I think everyone ought to know that you will be making uh, some resources available um, that we will share with people at a later date, but do you have any specific recommendations right now? So there's several books. Um, you know, if you're a fiction reader, you could turn to Mark Twain's seminal work, uh, Joan of Arc. So we think of Mark Twain as, you know, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, but Tom's, um, but Mark Twain's favorite book that he wrote, he was most proud of his book on Joan of Arc. Um, it's remarkably faithful to the accounts. He read um, the historical writings. And so if fiction's your thing, you have a great opportunity in that. Um, we have her trial. There's a couple different books, Joan of Arc in her own words. Um, there's this one that I'll put on the list, um, Joan of Arc, her writings by herself and her witnesses. And this gives it a remarkable account, um, almost word for word of what happened. Um, and so I will be putting some books on, on a resource list for you all. And if you are a silent film fan, and even if you're not, I highly recommend The Passion of Joan of Arc. It's a stunning performance. I am not a silent film fan. And it is, um, I, was, I was surprised how much I was drawn in to the production. It's, it's known as one of the greatest performances in silent film history, but um, The Passion of Joan of Arc is remarkably moving. Um, you don't probably want to watch it like on a Friday night with popcorn, but, um, but it is a, it's a stunning portrayal of her trial. Um, so, but I will be putting together some resources. Very good. Um, Randy uh, made a comment uh, or asked a question that I, 
I've wondered myself about, which is why do you think it took till 1920 for Joan to be canonized? I've had the same thought. Um, so her beatification was actually begun, um, the process was begun by the Bishop of Orleans, um, which makes sense. Um, he started the cause. And um, so she was beatified in 1909, but, um, or maybe that's when he started the process. But um, I do wonder that, that, and I think some of it is just our own struggle to see her. I was asked yesterday by a friend, they said, you know, I can see her, the, the importance of her story. And I can see that, you know, she's probably one of the most um, influential women in history, um, you know, with, except the Blessed Mother, of course. Um, but why a saint? Is she a saint? Is she holy? And I sometimes wonder if maybe the church kind of struggled with, okay, we can say, you know, we can say in, in, you know, the 15th century that she wasn't a heretic, but was she a saint? And I think that's, that's another question that has to be, to be examined. Um, and I, obviously the church believes she is and infallibly stated that she was, but I wonder, I've had the same, the same thought. And I wonder if it was kind of this wrestling with, she may not be a heretic, but is she a saint? And um, and ultimately, of course, the church decided she was. Yeah, I should have I should have mentioned. Thank you for that. I should have mentioned also uh, with your previous answer. Uh, Kevin Horgan had asked uh, about what you thought about Mark Twain's uh, mm. work on, and I, I I have read that as well. I I I don't normally enjoy historical fiction, but I I just uh, he's such a great writer. Yeah, and that's such a great work. I recommend that too. Uh, Mary had a question about, and maybe maybe you could go a little bit more into this uh, and provide some um, added clarity. Uh, why why was the church is the question so against Joan, as evidenced in the trial? Yeah. So um, really, when the church went back, so the rehabilitation trial, um, you know, called all these witnesses and. And I think the rehabilitation trial was really an attempt for the church to say, it wasn't us <laughs> in a sense. Um, it was really these English leaning bishops. So um, really, I mean, we could say that, I mean, Joan was tried by the church, but for, you know, as, as if you look at the way the trial was conducted, it really was a trial by the, by the British, by the English. Um, and so the church itself wasn't actually against Joan, but Pierre Cochon and his, his, the, the people like him um, were. A lot of these same characters that were in her trial, it's really interesting, they also then participated in the Council of, of Basel, Basel um, which eventually led to an anti-pope, and that's a whole other story, but it's a lot of the same figures. So um, they're really putting forth a different view of society, a different view of the church, and they wanted to embrace kind of this conciliar, um, that's what the council basically said, is the Pope was answerable to a council, which is false. Um, and so we're talking about a lot of prideful men who thought they like stood for the church. And many of her biographers say this, that they would say, we're the church, um, not the Pope in Rome. And that's a huge problem. Um, and so there's a lot of like political shifting that's happening here and she's the victim of it. So I would say the church in a sense, wasn't against her um, in the eyes of Ruin, right? At that trial, absolutely, right? She was being condemned by the church. She's standing in front of priests. She's standing in front of the bishop. Um, but in, in, the long, in the long game, right? When we step back and see the way God sees history, it really was um, a, a group of men who believe they spoke for the church and who abuse their power such um, to make an example of her out of vendetta. Yeah, so very much uh, some political motivation going on in there. And, and, and the place of the trial itself was, was historically speaking, uh, kind of like the headquarters in France of the English power. So uh, right. there, there was a lot going on behind this. Uh, I think it's I think it's also interesting and several comments have come in also along this line that God so often does use the weak and least expect it uh, to be able to do things. So I loved your I loved your reference to, to David and Goliath, but especially also Frodo and the ring. Um, and I, I, do you think that there's maybe more of us being asked to do things we think I apologize for the airplane flying over my head. Uh, you know, 
we sometimes maybe fail to act in doing the things that God is asking us to because we're waiting for that moment when, when we're given the ring and sent on this mission to Mount Doom, but uh, we, we don't recognize the other ways that God is calling us. Uh, I, I think the thing that I thought of when you were talking about her qualities was that she wanted to be holy. She strived for holiness. She wanted to know what God wanted of her, and she wanted to do that. And yeah. I think it really is that, that simple. How, how can you take these lessons these powerful lessons and how, how can Rand, Randy, for example, had a comment, how, how can you connect these with young people today? What, what, what things can we do to make these lessons and this thing more accessible to young people who need her example so much today? Yeah. I mean, I think the idea, and I, I completely agree with you, Deacon Mike, that so often we wait <coughs> for the great thing, you know, and we're, we're sitting around waiting um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Jose Maria Escrivá and the writings of Opus Dei and Father Francis Fernandez and his daily meditations often talks about mystical wishful thinking. Um, mystical wishful thinking, I will wait till I'm married, I will wait until I have kids, I will wait until I'm retired, I will wait until the grand big thing comes and then I'll be a saint. And to see that, that God's giving you ample opportunity every single day, it's just not glamorous. In fact, it's harder than the glamorous things. You know, we, we like to think that we would jump into battle for God, right? And take arrows out of our chests. But if we can't wake up on time in the beginning of the day, if we can't get to mass on time, if we can't work our daily rosary into our schedule, how are we going to pull an arrow out of our chest, right? And so it's that reminder that God is calling us to be a saint in little ways. It's a lot easier, in a sense, to be burned at the stake than to smile at that really annoying neighbor every single day and to not bite their head off, right? Um, and so we're often subject to the little white martyrdoms and even just the inconveniences of life. If I can't handle those, how am I gonna handle the big things? And so I think, um, and that's kind of my, my whole like mantra and when I, when I speak is, is finding holiness in the ordinary, ordinary time, right? That's I'm on Facebook, I'm Joan in ordinary time. Why? Because we're all waiting for the big stuff. But God's calling us to be holy in the little stuff. And if we can't be holy in the big stuff, if we can't be holy in the big stuff if we're not holy in the little stuff. And so um, I, I, I have a saying, I, I say saints are made on Monday mornings, right? Um, and so I think sometimes to remind young people that stop the mystical wishful thinking. I give a talk to uh, Theology on Taps a lot called The Art of Waiting. Um, and so often young people are just waiting like, well, as soon as I get married, right? As soon as I get a job and they're just sitting on their duffs waiting. And it's like, God, God gave you this time right now to be holy right now. If you can't be holy now, how are you going to be holy when you're married? Any married person knows it's just going to get harder. So you better be holy now so that you can go into that marriage holy. Um, and so I, I'd say young people need to be encouraged to be great um, now and to, to remind them that they're called to holiness in the little things. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I couldn't agree more. The uh, striving for excellence is, is at the forefront of much of what I talk about. And, and, and I don't think people realize that the, the opportunities that are being missed when, when they're not yeah. doing it. And to strive, for, to strive for excellence while practicing humility is certainly a key. And I, I, I see that I, I, I did like her little nudges, though, at, at some points in that trial, though. You have to admire her for that. Another question was, where, where were her parents and family during the trial? And were any of them harmed? So it's interesting. Um, she was actually told, like, she was told not to confide in people about her voices until she told Robert, until she told the Dauphin. So she actually left town without telling her parents, which is kind of tear I mean they kind of tried to use that like you know you disobeyed your parents and um but her parents we know she saw her parents so her brother um eventually joined her and we know she saw her parents at the crowning of King Charles they came to the crowning um and they were put up by the city for free and uh, you know the lovely little details like that um and so we know she saw her parents um we don't I don't believe she saw her parents before her death and, but it was her mother. Her mother was the only one still alive at the end of the Hundred Years' War. 
the Dauphin, to his credit, I guess, um, asked for Joan to be rehabilitated after the war. Um, it took him long enough, but you know, he was at war. So, um, so, but it wasn't enough for him to ask because that would have been a civil proceeding. Her mother went to the church. And so there's a famous scene where her mom goes into the um, Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris and makes the formal request for her, the case to be opened. Um, and that's what was required for the church then to go through with it. So um, Isabel, her mother, is the one that kind of paves the way for rehabilitation. Um, but she she did leave town without telling her parents, which I think doesn't sit well with parents, probably. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Lois uh, Karkoff uh, recommends a book. Have you read For God and Country? Uh, by Father, I don't think I have. Father Michael, I can't remember who it was. Um, Um, I I hadn't heard of that book either, but uh, a couple of people are recommending it. So it might be something worth looking into. I wrote it down. Yeah, I thought I'd, I thought I'd see most everything. One other personal comment. Uh, My wife and I were married at St. Joan of Arc Parish in Marlton, New Jersey. So uh, we've got that connection. Oh, nice personal connection. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I don't see any more questions right now. Um, a lot of a lot of good uh, feedback. Uh, I'll, you you should be able to see all the chats over here. We'll share that with you. A lot of encouragement for you. So it's been a wonderful wonderful presentation. Thank you. Yep, Randy, uh, would you like Thank to? Thank you so much. Us out? Yeah, I will. Thank you, Joan. This was incredible. Um, you know, I, I've long been a fan and a supporter, and I'm just uh, blown away by today. Uh, not, I, I didn't know what to expect. I not really, uh, I did not dive into her life in my in my past readings, and I learned so much today, and I'm inspired. Um, something I was really drawn to uh, was your definition of meekness and the lessons that that holds for us in today's world. Uh, a few notes: um, the meek control their anger and forgive their enemies. The meek trust in the Lord. The world needs more souls with self-mastery. And then we need to face adversity with charity, mercy, and trust. And in today's polarized world and and with all the division and hatred, uh, what a great lesson for us. I mean, very powerful. Uh, So uh, I I took so much, I took three pages of notes, but I was just really drawn to that in particular, uh, because I think many of us had a have an ongoing incorrect definition of meekness and I think you set us straight today. So um, one other question that I want to ask you is uh, someone earlier was curious about, uh, do you have a podcast, I happen to know that you join others in a podcast, do you have your own podcast, can you tell us about it. Sure. So um, I do get interviewed every once in a while. I actually did an interview about Joan of Arc for a podcast, Um, but I co-host a podcast called The Catholic Traveler. And um, The Catholic Traveler is a a young man um, who lives in Rome now, but is originally from Georgia, from outside of Atlanta. And uh, Mountain is a, um, a pilgrimage leader. So he kind of is unique in that he takes Catholic pilgrimages. He works with some people over like in the Holy Land in France, but He really like, especially in Rome, he does it all himself. And he's a a beautiful pilgrimage leader, really bringing people to faith through travel. And so we've led several trips together. We'll be leading a trip in September together to Rome. We're leading a trip to Oparamagao next year. And so uh, we have started co-hosting this podcast to kind of help people find their faith through travel. So that's the Catholic Traveler podcast. And then hopefully in the near future, I'll be starting my own podcast as well. Um, There are plans there, but... um, but need some, yeah, need some support for that. So I'm, I'm hoping to start my own podcast, but um, right now I do co-host that. It comes out every Thursday and we have about 70 episodes. We did a stretch through Lent on the, the pilgrim station churches of Lent. There's a different church every day in Lent that is featured in Rome. And so we did a podcast every morning um, about, you know, eight to 10 minutes on that di- on different churches. So we have about 70 episodes if people are interested in finding out more about um, travel and Rome and just general life, Catholic life through through that those adventures. Thank you. And listen, everyone, um, please go to Integrated Catholic Life. Every Friday, uh, Joan has been a prolific contributor. You'll find her posts there. Read them, share them, reflect on them. Uh, great work. Uh, today's post is uh, uh, just in that vein as well, something we should all read and reflect on. 
Um, Jen, I want to say thank you. Uh, I am certain that we will hear from you again, and we will definitely keep our partnership going and, and continue to help support your work. And I'd like to close this in prayer by um, asking for the intercession of St. Joan of Arc, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. St. Joan of Arc, we, we ask humbly that you intercede for us um, and intercede that we will take the lessons that were shared by Joan Watson today about your life. We pray that uh, the lessons that she shared on leadership, on appropriate meekness, and a love of the church that were um, uh, exemplified by your life, that are lessons that we will learn today. So we pray for your intercession, St. Joan of Arc. Uh, please pray for us. Please intercede for Joan uh, Watson and her work and her journey as a faithful servant of the church. We are grateful in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joan, thank you. We are grateful uh, for every minute of this. Uh, please do share any resources you'd like us to get out to the group. And everyone, we will have a recording of this talk available uh, probably by Monday, and it will be posted on the Integrated Catholic Life YouTube channel. We will send you a link to this. Again, Joan, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much.